Good afternoon. May I, I'm Dahi O'Callaghan. May I welcome you here uh, to this event with Tony Connolly of RTE. Um, I don't think he needs much of an introduction from me. Um, he's been in Brussels for a very long time. He's extremely well informed. And I think most of us in this room owe him a great deal of debt for his constantly, interestingly, and very authoritatively reporting from, from Brussels. Um, can I just make sure that your phones are on silent or turned off? Um, Tony, his initial speech will be for about 25 minutes or thereabouts on the record, and then he'll go off the record for the remainder of the event, and we'll finish at about two o'clock. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Dahi, and thanks again to the IIEA for the, for the invitation. I think it was just about the end of January when I, I spoke here last year, um, and I thought what I would do was to, uh, to kind of pick up where I left off at the end of January, because you remember at that point the, the December joint report, which basically gave birth to the backstop, the famous backstop, the hated backstop, as, as it's now called. Um, th that had been agreed, and then the, uh, the EU institutions were then going to uh, convert that into a legal text. Um, and I remember I came here, and, and, and I kind of basically brought people up to, up to how the backstop had, had evolved and how it had been agreed. So um, for those of you who were here last year, um, I'm, I'm going to pick up from, from where I left off. If you weren't here last year, I can recommend a book, uh, which, uh, which has all the detail, um, uh, uh, just in case you need, you need to be filled in. Um, so yeah, so, so this time last year, the European Commission and the European Council were trying to convert the political agreement of the joint report, which contained the backstop, into a, a legal text. And at, actually, I think it was about, th about the, this day, it was about I think the 27th of February last year, where the, uh, the, the, the commission draft of, of the Irish protocol and the rest of the withdrawal agreement, which had been fleshed out at that point, um, was published. Um, RT got a sneak preview the day before, so we broke the story of, of what was going to be in the, the, the backstop. And it basically said that in the absence of any other solutions, the uh, either technology or a future trade agreement, the way to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland was uh, for Northern Ireland to remain in the customs territory of the European Union. So obviously that worked out really well. Uh, for, for, for everybody concerned, that particular text. Um, in fact, the, the officials who were drafting this text uh, congratulated themselves on producing a very dry um, technical legal, legal document which would basically give legal effect to the joint report, which was a political agreement. Um, anybody who knows the history of the Irish peace processes should know that you can never put the word territory uh, in any kind of legal text when it comes to, uh, to Northern Ireland. So obviously Theresa May rejected the, the first iteration of the Irish Protocol. Oh, it, was, it was the same day that it was produced. She went into the House of Commons and said uh, no British Prime Minister would ever accept it. So I think this was kind of on the cards because when the idea of the backstop or the idea of Northern Ireland remaining aligned to the rules of the single market for goods uh, and, and to the rules of the customs union, um, it was immediately framed as a constitutional threat by David Davis when it was first uh, floated in November of 2017. And, and the British government never really departed from that analysis. Um, they, they, they never, there was never any benefit of the doubt um, when it came to the backstop. We, we can assume that the fact that the DUP was propping up Theresa May's government had a lot to do with that, but I think you know, the, the Conservative Party was also um, you know, very hostile to this idea of any customs or any other kind of border um, on the Irish Sea. The, the Irish government said that this was actually a political framing, not, not a legal framing necessarily. Um, so we, we had this sense of um, kind of stasis uh, in March of last year. The thing had been rejected. Um, 
in, in the March European Council, the UK were looking for the transition to be uh, adopted by the European Council, and uh, the British officials were worried that Leo Varadkar would actually try and block the transition until Theresa May uh, w would go back to her commitment on the backstop, which was in the joint report. Um, I mean, the Irish government were really worried that this was a backsliding by the UK. So Theresa May wrote a letter to Donald Tusk, the European Council President, saying that she was effectively recommitting herself uh, to the Irish backstop. Um, so in the meantime, uh, the, 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 the British government was then trying to kind of negotiate with itself as to what it, it regarded as the future relationship. Try, Theresa May was constantly fighting rearguard battles with her own party, trying to keep the policy on board. Um, so everything then shifted to uh, the Mansion House speech that she was going to make, uh, I think it was March uh, of last year. So basically, when she wrote this letter to Donald Tusk, that seemed to reassure the Irish government and the EU that she was sticking to her bona fides on the backstop, uh, and so the transition was then agreed. But then we, we, had, we didn't have a lot of time. We, we had to get the withdrawal agreement concluded by October of last year. There was talk about June being another kind of soft deadline. Um, but the Mansion House speech, I think, is quite important because... If you look at Theresa May's trajectory from when she became leader, she spelled out her very kind of hardline Brexiteer credentials in the, the Conservative Party conference in October of 2016. Out of the single market, out of the customs union, not bound by the ECJ, etc. Then she gave the Lancaster House speech in January of 2017, and that was basically a, a, a reaffirmation of those, uh, of those ideals, of those kind of desiderata. Um, by the time of March uh, last year and the Mansion House speech, she had very clearly moved her preferences to along the, the dial to a, a softer Brexit. And it's, it's quite interesting to look at that speech because for the first time she links the whole question of the just-in-time supply chains that facilitate uh, automotive manufacturing in the UK uh, with the Irish border and the, and the Good Friday Agreement. So she, I think, prompted by people like Ollie Robbins and Jeremy Haywood, the, um, uh, the ca late cabinet secretary in, in the UK, and figures from the Treasury, David Lidington and so on, she rather surreptitiously began to edge over along the spectrum to, to a softer Brexit. And her way of solving the Irish border issue and the just-in-time supply chain problem was on the one hand to create this customs partnership between the UK and the EU, which of course was a future relationship issue, not intrinsically con uh, embedded within the withdrawal agreement, um, and at the same time have some kind of understanding or blueprint for regulatory compliance. Uh, how, how can the UK have frictionless trade with the EU uh, while, while not, not being bound by the rules of the single market and the European uh, Court of Justice. So the Mansion House speech was essentially the blueprint for, for checkers, which came out in July, which, which again was not necessarily to do with the, um, with, uh, the withdrawal agreement and, and the Irish border, but was all about the future relationship. But of course, it's always very important to remember that the UK have always viewed the Irish border through the prism of the future relationship they never understood or really accepted that the Irish border question had to be resolved in the withdrawal agreement. They thought it was like, it's to do with customs, it's to do with trade. Why can't we solve this in the future relationship? So, so her, her vision of, 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 of fixing this problem was a customs partnership where uh, the UK would, would have the same tariff regime as the EU and then they would collect duties on behalf of the EU uh, and then reimburse um, uh, companies that uh, weren't sending their goods all the way to the EU and so on. Uh, an extremely convoluted uh, and tricky um, uh, piece of machinery, um, which originally had been floated in August of 2016. Um, so, so, so that was um, how she thought she was going to fix this uh, conundrum. So customs partnership then 
the single market, you would have what she was talking, uh, she was describing as mutual recognition. Okay, we've been members of the EU for 40 years. We have the same rules at the moment. So when we leave, we're kind of going to be uh, equivalent in, in terms of, you know, the regulations governing what we make and what we sell. Um, now, she was accepting that there are some rules in which uh, the UK will have to remain aligned to the EU and other sectors where they want to go their own way. Okay, now this is classic cake uh, cherry picking that the EU was never going to, um, uh, to, to accept. But, I, but I, I, I want to kind of remind people of this because this, this is actually germane to what's uh, happening at the moment. Um, but, but she was in conflict uh, actually with, with the ERG, the European Research Group, because they were the ones pushing technology maximum facilitation, whereas she was quite surreptitiously uh, pursuing this idea of a customs partnership and sector by sector alignment, um, which was still high alignment. Uh, and her ultimate belief was, yes, the technology might be there, but it might take 15 years. So in the meantime, we need to have certainty for car manufacturers, and we need, we need to solve the Irish border. So um, in June, the, the UK came forward with its, its first formal um, proposal on, on the Irish border, which was a temporary customs arrangement. Now, this is the UK-wide customs arrangement um, that uh, eventually made it into the withdrawal agreement. Now, now, what they did was, you'll remember the paragraph 49 of the joint report in, in December of 2017 said that if X and Y don't work, in other words, if technology doesn't work, if a free trade agreement doesn't work, then the UK will align with the rules of the single market and the customs union to avoid a hard border, protect the Good Friday Agreement, and preserve the all-island economy, etc., etc. Now, at the time, um, the EU and Ireland saw that as specifically for Northern Ireland, because paragraph 49 said this is, you know, Northern Ireland is a special case, etc. This is a, a specific, unique solution for Northern Ireland. And also, if if paragraph 49, this idea of the UK aligning, meant uh, the UK as a whole aligning, rather than the UK <coughs> aligning on behalf of Northern Ireland, then why do you need paragraph 50, which of course says, in a backstop situation, we won't have any uh, barriers in trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So anyway, there was, there was this fundamental um, you know, dichotomy in interpreting the joint report and paragraph 49. So anyway, the UK went back to this and said, well, actually, when we said the UK will align, what we really meant was the UK as a whole will align, but on customs, okay? So if, the, if there's a UK-wide customs partnership with the EU, then you're not going to have a customs border on the Irish Sea. So this is something that the, the unionists uh, might actually accept. Uh, and it will, it will provide stability and security for the, the supply chains, the automotive sectors, and so on. Now, the EU were... Um, impulsively, uh, I think, suspicious and un uncomfortable with this idea because, first of all, Article 50 and the negotiating guidelines say that Northern Ireland is a, is a unique and specific problem that has to be addressed. So, okay, we, we can bend the rules a bit for a, an economy the size of Northern Ireland, but an economy the size of the UK uh, with, uh, you know, fifth biggest economy in the world, population of... Uh, 50, 60 million, you know, that's a different uh, order of ma magnitude. We, we can't simply just plunk that into the withdrawal agreement as, as, a, as a fully fledged customs union. Uh, so that kind of was parked, and then we had the Checkers paper on the 4th of July last year, and that, that's again getting back to this hybrid model of customs partnership and a common rule book. And of course, the, all the attention then was on the resignations of David Davis and Boris Johnson and the further turmoil in the Tory party. And you remember at the time, I mean, Theresa May was like surviving week to week uh, in, in July of last year. Then September came around, uh, you know, we were a month away from the deadline of getting the withdrawal agreement concluded. There was that total train wreck in Salzburg um, where, when she came and she made a, a quite a... Um, it was quite a truculent kind of pitch to the UK, to the EU leaders that, you know, they had to be flexible on the backstop, you know, that it, it, um, it, was, it was very problematic and so on. Um, and, and what happened from Salzburg, because things got so toxic and so public, um, they created the tunnel, 
Okay, this is Sabine Vayan's idea that, that negotiators could go into a metaphorical tunnel and they, they work in conditions of complete secrecy and kind of hermetic uh, environment so that there aren't any leaks which can then, you know, in the febrile atmosphere of Westminster, cannot torpedo um, what, what's being negotiated. Um, there was a, an attempt to get it over the line um, before the October Council, which is really the kind of key deadline, but um, the backstop was still in there. The UK was still pushing for this UK-wide customs arrangement. Um, the backstop was... Dominic Raab wanted a, an expiry date for the backstop because if you think about it, the UK was saying, well, when the, if the backstop takes effect, it's not just going to be Northern Ireland, it's going to be the UK as a whole, and we will be in this customs union with the EU. But uh, the, the argument that Dominic Raab uh, put forward then, which is the same argument that you have today, was that, well, if we don't get this free trade agreement negotiated on time, then like, will, will we be stuck in this backstop customs union uh, situation uh, for, you know, for a long time, where we're, we're uh, you know, not... Uh, we have no say over the rules of the single market and so on. Um, so, so there was a fairly intense uh, couple of weeks before, um, be between October and November, when the deal was done. Now, there, there's a there, there was a way of looking at this by the European Commission, which didn't get an awful lot of uh, coverage at the time. <clears throat> so, Article 50, as you recall, uh, is, is the mandate for Michel Barnier's negotiations, um, and. The EU saw Article 50 as having three key elements. The first element was to deal with the, um, the kind of outstanding issues uh, to make it a an orderly withdrawal. So that really referred to the, the financial exit bill. The second was the, e the UK's enduring commitments, which uh, in this case was about citizens' rights and Northern Ireland. And the third was... That, the, uh, that Article 50 should provide a, a kind of a bridge to the future relationship. Because Article 50 says it has to take account of the framework for the future relationship uh, uh, between the UK and the EU. Now, the problem with this UK-wide customs union was it was temporary. The UK said this should only happen for uh, a couple of years or whatever, 10, 10 12 months or whatever, until this uh, future all-seeing, all-knowing all, all uh, free trade agreement is, is negotiated. But that didn't fit into the three categories that are the three kind of key elements of Article 50. So what the European Union task force did is to say, well, look, um, you know, we, we've, we've looked at what you do with this customs union idea. We, we, it was going to be uh, in, in the political declaration, which, of course, was non-binding. The UK didn't want that because it wasn't legally binding. Then they said, well, we can put it in the preamble of the withdrawal agreement to say that, you know, we intend to negotiate a temporary customs arrangement with the UK if a, if, if a free trade agreement isn't done in time so that we can avoid this nasty backstop thing. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, the EU said, well, that, the preamble is not, an, an, it's not legally binding. So eventually, the, the, uh, you know, like the clock was ticking, and the EU said, OK, we will agree to put this in the withdrawal agreement as a fully-fledged legal article uh, or series of articles uh, if... If it can, only if it can comply with the three key elements of Article 50, the third, of course, being the important one, which means it's a, it's a bridge to the future. So as one official said to me, it, it's um, the, the, the temporary customs union or partnership, UK-wide, is a starter home. Okay? It's something that's going to be built on for the future so that it's, it sort of it informs the direction of travel. Uh, so that was, that was the only condition under which the EU was prepared to really bend the rules of Article 50 to have this uh, customs union in, in the withdrawal agreement because it should really have been in the future relationship because it's not, it's not a divorce. Um, but this is the UK's way of keeping the DUP on board, essentially. Uh, so, um, so, so, so this was then, then put to the UK negotiators. I mean, are you sure that this is what you want? And they said, yes, OK. So if you look then at the political declaration which was published uh, alongside the withdrawal agreement, the phrase built on uh, crops up time and again. The customs union idea is going to be built on in the future relationship. So you can see 
uh, you know, you can see what's happening here. What is happening is that the UK is signaling that it wants to be aligned for customs into the future. Now, the, the way the negotiations happen in the UK, in, in the EU, is that you have these meetings and uh, that the following week or the next two days later, Sabine Weyand will, will go in to the working party of uh, the members. So these are officials from all the member states. And she will brief the member states, or Michel Barnier will brief the member states. This is what we decided this week. Uh, okay, I know it's different from last week, but uh, this is where things are at. So, so the member states were kept in the loop at every stage. Did Theresa May do the same thing in the House of Commons? Absolutely not. She was keeping this in a very tight uh, circle of advisors and uh, senior figures in, in the cabinet office. So that when the uh, withdrawal agreement was being concluded and the ERG could, could get a whiff of this uh, permanent customs union and this, this uh, you know, bridge to the future. And that was why they said, we, we need to hear what the Attorney General is going to say on this. So they put an awful lot of pressure on the government to get the Attorney General to publish his advice. So you remember there was a, there was a motion in the, in the uh, Commons to force the government, and they, I think they rejected it, but then they had to come back. So the Attorney General, Geoffrey Cox, wrote a letter to... Theresa May on the 13th of November saying, um, yes, the withdrawal agreement has all these uh, you know, phrases about using best endeavours to get the free trade agreement negotiated as quickly as possible so we never have to use this dreaded backstop. Uh, but under international law, if we don't conclude that free trade agreement, if those negotiations break down, then we are potentially trapped indefinitely in the backstop. So, so from then on, the backstop you know, just you know, uh, acquire these uh, grotesque, um, you know, uh, sort of visions and, and implications for, for, the, for the Conservative government and the Brexiteers. And, and that is really why the withdrawal agreement uh, just got hammered when it was, when it was published and, and agreed on the 25th of November. Um, and the, the very fact that Theresa May had not, you know, educated and informed the House of Commons and her party all along as to, as to why she was doing this, then it, it was a shock then to the House of Commons. Um, obviously, Labour were going to vote against it because they just wanted to get to, to inflict as much damage on Theresa May as possible. Um, uh, and a, obviously, large uh, parts of her party were going to do that as well. So we, we've been in this kind of... Uh, kind of hamster wheel since then because she came back then in December. She had to pull the vote in the early early part of December because she knew it was going to be trounced by the House of Commons. She came back to the European Council in the middle of December and said, I need some help here. We need to do something about the backstop. And the, the EU um, said to her, well, look, um, if you want, if, if you're um, preeminent solution to this is, okay, Theresa May was never going to just say the backstop has to go, but she always said that the, the key to getting the backstop kind of eclipsed is the future trade negotiation. And the EU of, uh, leaders at that d dinner in, in, uh, in December said, well, it's not just the fact of having a trade agreement, it's actually what's in it. Because what's in it will determine whether you need to have, you know, guys in, in, uh, in, in high vis jackets on the Irish border, checking uh, you know food products coming back and forward. It's it's the, you know the, the Irish border will only be kept invisible if it's if, if if it's a free trade agreement of very high alignment. And you haven't had that conversation in the UK, not not in the public, not in the House of Commons, not in your party. So that was why uh, Jean Claude Juncker used the term nebulous, uh, and and she kind of took that, or the British system took that as a personal slight on her. But what he was saying was. You know, the, the debate in the UK is nebulous because, you, you, you know, there's no point in, in just saying that everything's going to be fine as long as there's a free trade agreement. You need to know what's in the free trade agreement. Um, and, and that's the essential problem. So, so where we're at at the moment is obviously in January, um, the Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk on the 14th of January wrote this letter to say, um, OK, you know, we affirm that the... Backstop is temporary unless and until it's superseded by a future agreement. Uh, we will speed up the free trade negotiations. We, we can even start the negotiations before, you know, after the treaty is signed, but before it's been formally, you know, before you formally leave at the end of March. 
Um, we can do all these things to show our, our kind of best in, in intentions and best endeavours and so on. But of course, you know, they wrote this letter the day before the House of Commons rejected the withdrawal agreement by the biggest margin in history. So that, that didn't really work very well. Um, so, so since then, um, the, I suppose the analysis after the, the January vote was that you know, this margin of defeat is so huge that it can't just be about the backstop. I mean, it's got to be other stuff. Uh, and this was actually problematic for um, the government in London because it was convenient for, for London to, to have the narrative that it is only about the backstop because if they, if they could get the DUP on board, then the analysis was that the rest of the, of the Tory party, including large numbers of the European Research Group, would, would be on board. So, so that was why she went for this uh, notorious Brady Amendment at the end of January in which he said, you know, the House of Commons will uh, support this treaty uh, if you just take that backstop thing, you know, just, that, just get rid of that and, and we're, we're fine. Um, but obviously that, that, uh, that was not going to, to fly in, in Brussels. So where we're at at the moment is um, the focus has now gone back to Geoffrey Cox, the Attorney General, because of course it was his advice which, uh, you know, uh, frightened the horses back in uh, November, December. So the idea is if we can just get Geoffrey Cox to change his legal advice, then hey presto, we can get everybody back on board. So uh, there, there, there's kind of three work streams going on at the moment. There is um, alternative arrangements. So the Theresa May's had a couple of meetings and they've, they've had a joint statement saying the EU and the UK will vigorously pursue uh, you know, uh, per alternative arrangements, meaning technology, uh, as a way to make sure that if the backstop ever even threatens to be uh, applicable, then this technology will be here uh, in, in turn. So in, in Brussels, they call that unicorn hunting. Uh, <laughs> not disparaging uh, at all uh, whatsoever, um, but, uh, but that, that's, that's the way this is being viewed in, in Brussels. Then, then the next um, element is, is you know, looking at, at legal guarantees uh, that the backstop is temporary. So that's really where the, where the tough work is going on at the moment. So Geoffrey Cox has been in Brussels back and forward um, with Steve Barclay, and they're, they're, they're looking at, again, some way of, of you know, the, the word you hear from the UK is, is rebalancing, okay? So, so, the, so the, the kind of, the, the UK is, is basically upset that the backstop is in the withdrawal agreement, so it's legally binding. Um, the thing to replace the backstop is the future relationship, but that's in the political declaration, which is not legally binding. So this is kind of uh, asymmetrical. So is there some way of making that future relationship mandate or blueprint uh, legally binding? Now, there's an interesting kind of uh, thread, uh, which, uh, which I will uh, talk about, and then I can, I can conclude, um, that, uh, you know, again, we get back to this issue of the future relationship. What will it look like? You've got the world's, the fifth biggest economy in the world, trying to have a frictionless relationship with the EU who are saying it's only frictionless if you're in the single market. So if you want to have that kind of frictionless trade, you're either in the single market or uh, you're so close that you're going to have to be under the remit of the European Court of Justice and so on. But the UK um, still believes that you know, it, it, it can't have that kind of uh, integrated um, relationship with the EU. It, it's simply too big. Uh, it, it's, it's manufacturing and construction uh, or uh, production base is, is so kind of closely aligned with the EU already that uh, there has to be another way. And it's almost like the Jeffrey Cox is, is, is going to want to get the, a position where he can say, if the EU isn't acting in good faith to give us that more flexible relationship with the EU, with the EU uh, in the future, then we should have the right to walk away from this process. So, 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 uh, if there is any kind of exit clause, you know, my my understanding is that that's something that, that they're kind of pushing. Um, the EU is not going to really buy that because the EU believes that it has regulatory autonomy. Uh, only the EU can make the rules for the single market. They they can't have this uh, kind of you know, ghost uh, in, in infrastructure sitting to one side, you know, uh, somehow determining uh, bits of rules here and there for different sectors. Um, so the feeling in Brussels that, I, that I've been getting in the last week is that 
you know, the best that Jeffrey Cox can really get is something along the lines of the Tusk Juncker letter. Again, spelling out that the, the withdrawal agreement, uh, the Irish Protocol, is temporary unless and until it's superseded by something else. There may be some <coughs> tinkering with the review clause. They're looking again also at the political declaration. Can they change the language in there, which again reinforces this idea that the backstop is temporary? Uh, so they have between now and the 12th of March to, to produce a text that will be agreed by Michel Barnier and Stephen Barclay with Geoffrey Cox's uh, you know, uh, imprimatur as well. And then the idea is that he goes back to the House of Commons and says, actually, uh, everything's fine. Uh, we've, we've got this, uh, it says here, you know, the, temporary, the thing is temporary, so we have nothing to worry about. Um, so, uh, so that's where things are at. I'm, you know, my feeling is that, that there, there is still quite a big gap between the two sides. There's a lot of deep water. Um, and the, for, for that reason, there is not a huge amount of optimism in Brussels. Um, so the, the other big news of this week, of course, is that Labour has said there, there's going to be potentially a second referendum. And also that Theresa May has finally accepted the reality that she may have to extend Article 50. Now, I can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but that's really bringing you up to date uh, from when I was here last, last year to, to, to this week. So thank you very much. Great.